good morning everyone um so this is a video on introduction to calculus and my name is samir i'm from ignite and i'm teaching um so this will be the first video on calculus calculus is one of the most important domains of mathematics and it has several implications not only in mathematics but also in other fields as well for example physics it has it has immense application in physics so in layman's terms calculus is the mathematics of the small if we have a real life application i can give you a real life application suppose you're traveling in a car or in any vehicle and i ask you at a particular instant of time i ask you what is your speed you will say that it is 60 kilometers per hour but when you say that half a second would have passed it means the speed that you are saying is not exactly at that instant the concept of instantaneous speed might have been introduced to you in kinematics in order to calculate the instantaneous speed we have to reduce the amount of time and this is done by calculus so give you another example which i have write down here if this is a hill and if this is an object the object is thrown down consider at a certain instant of time i ask you what is the speed of the object at this time well first of all calculate the distance d1 equals ut plus half gt square d1 is equal to minus 5t square where g is equal to minus 10 meters per square second so after one second d1 is equal to minus 5 meters so this d1 is equal to minus 5 meters so then you would say that my speed is equal to distance divided by time that is minus 5 meters per second but no that is wrong we need to calculate the instantaneous speed and that you can only do when you consider a small time frame after this one second so for example if you're if your object has fallen down minus 5 meters if you want to find the instantaneous speed you need to calculate the distance that the object travels in that very small time frame so if the object goes if if it travels this much distance you need to calculate that distance over that amount of time so let's see what happens over here at one second which we calculated the distance traveled is 5 meters so this is the 5 meter mark at a later instant for a very short period of time suppose uh, we that short period of time we give the simple delta so the distance traveled d2 in this uh, the the uh, the distance traveled is equal to 5 into 1 plus delta t whole square using this formula when we expand this d2 is equal to 5 into 1 plus delta t whole square plus 2 delta t which is equal to 5 plus 10 delta t plus 5 delta t whole square now the distance traveled in time delta t is equal to d2 minus d1 which is equal to 5 which is equal to 5 plus 10 delta t plus 5 delta t square like we got from here minus 5 which we got from here so eventually we get that the distance traveled in that short period of time is 10 delta t plus 5 delta t whole square so the new speed is the new distance traveled divided by the time taken so we continue from here um so calculus is broadly divided into two domains
वन इज डिफरेंशिएशन एंड द अदर इज इंटीग्रेशन इन डिफरेंशिएशन एज आई टोल्ड इट इज द मैथमेटिक्स ऑफ द स्मॉल सो वेन आई सेड दैट डेल्टा टी was as it was very small and the term used was infinitesimally small we don't we no longer use the the, the symbol delta but we use the symbol d this d is an operator the d means that the time that we, the time that we consider is very small that is the meaning of d now in differentiation you often come across terms like this or this and here these are not two factors but these the, the but d by dt this is equivalent of this so we do not cancel d this is merely an operator so this is as a whole so i can give you like like i can i can encapsulate this in a box and say f like this so this is an operator this is a this is an entity as a whole that is why you don't cancel the d out now um before introducing the concepts of differentiation and integration i would like to uh, introduce a small concept called as limits limits is a very simple concept if if this is my graph and if i have a function if i have a very simple function suppose y equal to x square whose graph looks somewhat like this pardon me for my uh, rough sketch so if the graph looks something like this limit is generally the limit generally gives the approximate value at a certain point so we know that suppose um, point 2 comma 4 we we suppose that this is point 2 comma 4 what limit says is if i bring a point from here and slowly bring it to here what value am i approaching limit answers this question it also answers that if I, if i bring a point from this point and i bring it to here what point am i approaching so limit is basically if i am limiting a value to a certain point what value will i get okay this might sound completely confusing i'll give you an example if i say there are two ways of writing limit one way is this the other way is this this is l i m small i l l and this is capital l and t so the way we use limits or the way limits is uh, used in mathematics is like this limit f of x where x tends to 2 this is how you use now the meaning of this is limit f of x f of x is the value of y right so what this generally what this actually means is what value does f of x approach when x approaches 2 uh and that can be from the right hand side or the left hand side now in order to denote which side we are actually using we can actually put a plus sign over here to say that it's approaching from the right hand side on the other hand if it's a minus sign that means that we are considering a point coming from the left hand side so in our case let us consider the first when it approaches from the right hand side so what limit means is when a point uh, when the point approaches from the right hand side when x approaches 2 so if x was 3 over here when x approaches 2 what is the value that f of x approaches to that is what limit means now to calculate that it is very simple we keep writing this limit x tends to 2 you can write plus or minus it is your choice because once when we write plus in the beginning it is redundant to keep writing it again and again because it's understood so limit x tends to 0 f of x is x square now as x tends to 2 x square becomes 4 that means my y approaches 4 now mind you that Four is not a fixed value. I mean, uh, when I say uh, the answer of limits is not a particular value, it is tending to. So when I say uh, x tends to two, the answer also tends to a value. 
So I did not in the end say that the answer of the limit is a constant. It's I say that the the limit is approaching four. So it all makes sense, right? When I say the point is coming like this, so as x tends to two, y tends to four. That is what limit in the end says. Uh, if I go from the left hand side, limit x tends to two minus f of x. Limit x tends to two. You can drop that minus sign because it's not necessary now. X square equal to four. Uh, you can actually write equal to, but it actually is tends to four. This is the meaning of limits. The now the reason why I want to introduce limits is to explain to you the concept of differentiation. Now I have here, uh, but before that I need to explain to you what a tangent means. So I have here a paper. Mm. So this is again the y equal to x square parabola, and you can see a p uh, a b c d and e f are tangents to the parabola at various points, as you can see point p, point q, and point r. So these are tangents. Now if we consider the graph y equal to x cube, it looks somewhat like this. Again, pardon me for my rough sketch. So we have seen in physics that graphs like this, you, you have uh, often come across a concept, uh, a term called slope. Slope is basically how inclined a certain portion of a graph is with respect to the x-axis. So if if this point is inclined by this much angle, if by this much angle, it is it is inclined by so much and at this point it is inclined a little more this much so it has a more inclination that's what slope means now in order to calculate slope mathematically we use the concept of limits so it is pretty obvious that when if you want to calculate the slope the inclination at this point if you extend this it becomes a tangent if you extend this small portion it becomes a tangent. So if we find the inclination of that tangent, we can say that the slope at that point is the slope of the tangent. So now how do you find the slope of the tangent? Now for this triangle that I drew, the slope, you need to bring this point B close over here and this point A close to over here so that, so that it becomes a tangent like this. Because if I have a tangent, if I have a tangent over here and if I have a tangent over here, these need to come together in order to form a tangent like this and that is when I want to use that is where I have to use limits so for example um, I have this sine curve over here y equal to sine x now what I do is we use d by dx of sine x like this as I told this is an operator you can maybe make a box and say box of sine x. Uh, in the beginning you can keep using this box in order to understand that this is a whole entity and not d and dx. So an operator, so uh, derivative of sine x, we use the term derivative. Okay. So derivative of sine x is calculated as limit h tends to 0. So a, so a general derivative is limit h tends to 0 f of x plus h minus f of x by h what it actually means is if you take a, if you consider a point x um, if i consider point x over here right so f of x plus h f of x plus h so if i take um, h as some you know pi by pi by 12 or something so if this is my h if this is my h um, okay i will consider it over here leave it so if this is my h over here, what I see is f of x plus h, that means this value y minus f of x, that means this divided by h, this. So you can see this, uh, this value minus this value, that means I'm talking about this, right? I'm speaking about this. So it's again, um, it's perpendicular divided by base like I told as we learned in physics slope is delta y by delta x similarly over here it is this delta y which is f of x plus h minus f of x divided by delta x which is h now in order to calculate the slope or the derivative we need to make this 
difference really really small so that these two points approach each other and we use the concept of limits we say that h tends to zero that means this becomes really really small and this point approaches this point so that is how you calculate uh, the slope um, so if you if you cannot understand why d by dx of sin x is the slope well you can forget at the for, at the time being you can just leave it because i'm going to prove in the end that d by dx is actually the slope uh, actually well the, it is actually really simple you don't uh, you need to wait if you if you look at this if you have the graph y equal to x cube dy is a small change in y which is over here and dx is a small change in x which is here it means dy by dx which is as you learn the slope the perpendicular the difference in the height and difference in base is your slope it's the same thing so as i told d and d don't cancel now coming back now as you have understood now as you have understood d by dx is actually the slope so let's go ahead and calculate the slope or the derivative the derivative is the slope the derivative of a graph at every point is the slope at those corresponding points so the slope is limit h tends to 0 sin of x plus h minus sin of x because f of x equal to y divided by h now from the trigonometric classes recall the expansion of this so d by dx of sin of x uh, while solving all these problems always include this limit we generally tend to forget we generally tend to forget uh, writing down this limit but don't forget that because that is a very important um, factor and if you if you remove this limit there is there is no point because it has to tend to zero so you need to include this limit at all times otherwise it doesn't make sense so when we expand this it becomes sin of a plus sin of a plus b is equal to sin a cos b plus cos a sin b right so sin x cos h plus cos x sin h and this is sin x divided by h now um i take sin x common so sin x common um 1 minus cos h plus cos x sin h which is over here well it's actually minus sin x common if i take minus sin x common it becomes 1 minus cos h now i can split these terms limit cos h cos x into sin h divided by h minus limit x tends to 0 sin x 1 minus cos h by h i did not tell you the rules of limits the rules of limits are really quite simple it is those as you encountered in algebra or in logarithm or not logarithm but in general very simple simple rules limit uh, limit of two quantities when you have limit and in the bracket we have two quantities you can separate the limits it is very intuitive and um, second is if you have a constant limit uh, of a constant into uh, a dependent function then you can take the constant out like this if you have limit of something divided by something you can take the limit over here and the limit over here it is quite possible provided g of c is not equal to 0 because when limit x tends to 0 if it happens to be g of c if it's equal to 0 then it is undefined limit x tends to 0 f of x into g of x is you can split the factors and then you can apply the limit in each of these factors and these are these are very useful results that you can need to remember limit h tends to zero sin of h by h is equal to 1 um you can th this is very this is very intuitive because if you have a triangle and if this is theta sin theta is equal to perpendicular uh you can take this as perpendicular p by hypotenuse maybe h so sin theta is equal to perpendicular by hypotenuse now when h tends to zero that means when theta tends to zero so as i was saying as theta becomes smaller and smaller sin theta and and theta become almost the same so when they come become smaller and smaller if they become the same that means the they cancel out and it becomes one 
So similarly, tan h by h equal to 1 when limit h tends to 0 and when limit h tends to 0, log of 1 plus h by h equal to 1. So we're going to use this right now. See, so we had this step, right? Um, so we use this one, this becomes 1. Uh, this can be taken out because this is general, this is a constant over here, right? Because this h tends to 0. So this is a function of x. So it has nothing to do with h. It's a constant. You can take it out. So it becomes cos of x into 1 minus this also, this becomes 0. So 0 into anything is 0. So it becomes cos of x. So what I mean right now is the slope at every point of sine of x is cos of x. Meaning if I take um, as you can see, if I take the topmost point, sine of x is equal to sine of pi by 2, which is equal to 1. So the slope is cos of x, which is cos of pi by 2, which is equal to 0. And that's true because the tangent in this point is parallel to the x-axis. And that means the slope is 0. It has no inclination to the x-axis. That means the result is true. Now similarly, limits can be used to find the derivatives of um, whatever functions you like. Um, the sim some of the simple functions whose, whose results I've, I've taken down the results over here. So it is simple for you. So here I have some results of certain derivatives of functions. So as I derived now, d by dx of sin x is cos x. So certain other derivatives which I derived are d by dx of cos x is minus sin x, tan x is 6 square x, cot, is, cot x is minus cos x square x, Cosec x is minus cosec x cot x, sec x is sec x tan x, x raised to n is n x raised to n minus 1, so it could be d by dx of x square could be 2x, d by dx of x5 could be 5x4, so that's how it works. d by dx of e raised to x is e raised to x itself, this does not change, and you'll find a lot of posts on social media on mathematical jokes on this, so you will pretty much remember this uh, d by dx of ln x is 1 by x so we need to remember this um, now we come to the other part of calculus which is integration now integration there are two types of integration one is definite integration and indefinite integration but that will take a long time if I keep explaining what it all means so I will explain to you what indefinite integration is uh, I am sorry I will explain to you what definite integration is so definite integration gives us the area under a curve so in order to do that we need to so, um, yeah in order to do that this is how we do it so if we have if we have a random curve like this so what definite integration does is it finds the area under this curve now if now to find the area under this curve this is an arbitrary curve so we cannot use normal geometric methods to find the area of this curve. So what we do is we divide this into very thin strips of width dx and this is why. Now this left out portion, this triangle is uh, neglected because this strip is so small and when this becomes so small this triangle eventually becomes zero, the area becomes zero. So when we make it so small it's as if this whole thing is covered so this is how we make it if this is x equal to a and this is x equal to b okay so the technique used is um, we the area of this triangle uh, rectangle is y dx right now we need to have several such rectangles like this of same width dx right so we need to have several such rectangles so if I say this is y1 this is y2 and the like so y1 plus y2 dx plus y3 dx and so on till yn dx maybe where this is a small strip and this is yn so area is equal to so and so but <coughs> if if my dx becomes so small uh, n becomes infinite so we cannot use the normal summation so what we do is uh, uh, just like d was a small element, so if d so d theta is a small theta. So uh, contrary to that, we use a simple called integral integration. Integration is the opposite of differentiation, wherein instead of small, this is this denotes big. 
So this we can write it as y dx integration. This is the symbol of integration. Um, integration. So from a x equal to a to x equal to b. This is how we write it, and then we compute the integral. Um, now uh, it will be a pretty long video if I show you how to compute integrals. That is, let's keep that. Uh, let's we'll teach that in another course when we when we have a video on integration. So this is what uh, integration is. Now this is definite integration. And if I just have y dx like this without any, you know. Uh, these points over here, then it's called indefinite integration. And these things are called limits. Now don't confuse these limits with the limits that we discussed. These are not the same limit. These are different limits, but they have the same name. So what we discussed till now is calculus. We we introduced ourselves to calculus. Calculus is divided into two parts, differentiation and integration. Uh, so to start off that, we into, we learned the concept of limits, how how when we limit one variable to a certain point, what happens to the dependent variable. That is what we explained in limits. And then we come to differentiation. Differentiation gives us a slope uh, uh, at every point of a graph. And that is given by dE by dx of f. Now some of you might have wondered, when I told this is an object, we cannot separate it. But yet, slope was dy, that is a small change in y, divided by small change in x. How am I separating dy and dx over there? Well, it is one and all the same because this is dy dx, that means slope of f, and this is dy by dx. It's actually one and the same. You can actually write it. If you want, you can separate it. If you want, you cannot separate it. Separate it. So that's up to you. But if I, if I write it as small change in y divided by small change in x, or if I write it as change of y with respect to x. So this is read as change, small change in y divided by small change in x. This is read as um, <coughs> uh, a change in a variable with respect to x. And that variable happens to be y. So that is how these both are read. And eventually it becomes the same thing. But always keep in mind, do not cancel these d's. That is, that is the first thing we, need, we should not do. So. Uh, we come to an end of this video i hope uh, you understood you had a pretty you know tight idea about what uh, calculus is all about um many people say that it is a difficult um a difficult chapter but it is actually not if you understand it it is a really really good chapter and you'll understand that um the ones who created this is was a genius and isaac newton created this and it's supposed that he created this overnight because he was given some challenge and he could not do it because he was lacking the mathematics behind it. So he sat down at night and created a whole domain in mathematics called as calculus. Now, many say that this is not true, but um, if many, if some people say it, so it, there should be some truth behind it, right? So such is the importance of calculus. So thank you. That'll be all. Goodbye.